Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Good morning. It's great to be with you all. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chris, and you have the privilege of listening to me today. What a privilege it is and an honor. Little Susie, a six-year-old, complained to her mother, Mom, I've got a stomachache. Mum says, that's because your stomach is empty. Mother replied, and you would feel better if you had something in it. That afternoon, Susie's father came home complaining of a severe headache. Susie perked up and said, that's because it's empty. You'd feel better if you had something in it. It's a little bit too close to home, that one. Where do you go from there? No. Um, could you imagine for me this, the, the sense of anticipation? Has anyone ever ordered something on Amazon or online? And uh, you click on the checkout box and it says, in two to three days, your parcel will be dispatched. And you're like, here it goes. I've got my special order. It's on its way. Two to three days later, or the, on the third day, usually, you get an email saying, we're out of stock. Uh, we will get back to you in 20 business days, which is four weeks. So your anticipation for that particular part package go, starts to dwindle. And then on the 20th day, you receive another email saying, your package has arrived, is now in stock. We will deliver it to you in the next two to three business days. In the next two to three business days, you get another email saying, your parcel has now been dispatched and it will be at your residence in the next five to 12 business days. <laughs> 15 weeks later, you receive your package. And you've, you've wondered what, why, and how did it get there? That sense of anticipation over the time has peaked, dwindled, peaked again, and then dwindled. It's a bit like you could you know, have a bit of a sense of what it's like for Clarissa when, when I come home and she looks at her watch at five minutes to four and she goes, oh, Chris will be home at any second now. <laughs> Walking through those doors. At two minutes to four, she looks at it again. Are we leaving in a couple of minutes? At five past, the sense of anticipation continues to build. Maybe at 15 past, I rock up and she hears the squeak of my brakes on my push bike. Nothing more romantic than rocking up to your house on your push bike. I walk in the door, door flings open. I'm glistening in sweat. And the first person to meet me is my dog. And Clarissa's like, oh, he's home, finally. The anticipation is over. He is home. You can chat about that later with Clarissa. <laughs> but we have this sense sometimes that anticipation is, is something that we look forward to the most, but when it doesn't quite get there, and when it's not when we expect it, what our attitude is. Now, for all those who are believers in the house, Jesus is coming again soon. Jesus is coming and that's a promise. My challenge to us is, what's our attitude while we wait? Our challenge to us is that there should be anticipation. There should be expectancy. But what are we doing in the meantime? You know, you tend to have two camps when you discuss Jesus coming again. And um, you have those that are the, the more fanatical side of things, you know, that, that every time there's a full moon or every time that Joe Biden sneezes, it's some prophetic gift, it's some prophetic... But it's, and then you've got those who don't care. It's not for me at the moment. I've got too many other things on my, on my plate and on my agenda. And, and sometimes we're forced to pick a side. Sometimes we're, we're forced to say, oh, you've got to be in this camp and, and, or in that camp. And I'm not here to discuss pre-millennial, post-millennial, pre-wrath, aftermath. It's, it's, nothing, it's nothing to do with that this morning. All I know is that Jesus is coming. And in the meantime, we are to be busy. The title of this message today is Eyes Up But Hands Busy. We have to be busy. In three of the four Gospels, Jesus talks about his second coming. In quite a few of the epistles, Paul talks about Jesus coming. Peter, in his two letters, talks about Jesus coming. The book of Jude, John, and, and Revelation all talk about Jesus coming again. 27% of our Bible is prophetic. 
It's a fairly big chunk. So Jesus is coming. So we have to have our eyes up and ready. But what are we doing with our hands? So today's reading is going to be from 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And this is Paul writing to the Thessalonian church. And they were concerned at the time about where their loved ones were going to end up, those who had died or had passed away at the time, and, and where they were going. And so Paul was writing to them at a place of comfort. And it says this, this is from the NLT. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people say everything is peaceful and secure, the disaster will fall on them as suddenly as the pregnant woman's labour pains begin and there will be no escape. That's encouraging. But you are in the dark about all of these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief, for you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night, so be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us live in the light and be clear-headed, protected by the armour of faith and love and wearing our helmet, the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that we, whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage one another and build each other up just as you are already doing. There's a lot in that verse. So what does it mean to have eyes up and hands ready? I think there's three, there's three principles in that verse that I'd love to highlight today that will help us to continue to think about things with an eternal perspective. See, when we have an eternal perspective... It actually changes the lens and the outlook of our life here on earth. We are called to be in this world, but not of it. We have a different calling in this world to the world around us. So I wanted to go to verse 6. And it says here, So be on your guard, not be asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. When it comes to seeing and understanding that Jesus is coming... It's saying here, we have to be alert. We have to be clear-headed. In Jesus, when he mentions it in the, in the Gospels, he says, watch or keep a lookout, be alert, be ready. Those terms are used consistently when talking about Jesus coming again. Be alert. So how do we stay alert? Well, we need to be, it says it fairly obvious here, we need to be clear-headed. Sometimes when we, when we look at the situations and the circumstances around Jesus coming, that becomes our focus, not the fact that Jesus is coming. In Ezekiel 33, it talks about being a watchman, as in what would, what would occur is that they would have, not castles, but they'd have fortresses and, and, and city walls, and, and the watchman would sit at the parapet and look out down the valley, and what they, that watchmen had the responsibility of if they saw the enemy coming and they warned the people but the people do any, didn't do anything about it that wasn't on the watchman, that was on the people but if the watchman saw the enemy coming and decided not to say anything that was on the watchman whatever the result was as catastrophic as it may have been was on the watchman we are called to be watchmen we are called to keep our eyes and ears across the situations and circumstances that happen in our world. We are to be in tune with what's happening in the political sphere or in the cultural sphere. But that's not to consume the be-all and end-all of who we are. It might be a sign that Jesus might be around the corner, but the fact of the matter is if we're not clear-headed and that becomes our focus and not Jesus, we've missed the mark. And what happens is, is that we look, we have our eyes up, but our hands are doing nothing. And what Jesus is saying is that, watch, but then act. Keep your eyes on me, because I am coming, 
because he, he's been coming for 2,000 years and it might be another 2,000 years and then it might be another 2,000 years after that. I'm hoping we go today <laughs> after coffee this afternoon. It'd be great. <laughs> I'm keen. But if he doesn't come when I expect him to, doesn't mean my anticipation lessens. I just have to keep busy. Verse 8 says, But let us live in the light and be clear-headed. He says that twice in this particular chapter. Protected by the armour of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Let me read that again. But let us live in the light and be clear-headed, protected by the armour of faith and love and wearing the helmet, the confidence of our salvation. That word confidence there is in the New King James, the word is hope. The hope or the confidence of our salvation is the helmet that we wear. Hebrews 11 one says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. In another translation, it says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the things not yet seen. Hope is one of those things that we tend to get confused with. We, I used to associate hope with the crossing of the fingers and like, hope you get well soon. Uh, I hope we win the house. <laughs> sort of this, this wishful thinking like, oh, I've got hope. I hope that I get to go to bed soon. It's, it's, it's one of those things where it tends to be a little bit more abstract. But hope is not wishful thinking, but a tense anticipation. There are several Hebrew words, and this is what I love about the scriptures. This is what I love about the Bible. You could read the English Bible and get plenty out of it. But if you were to go deeper and get into the Hebrew and the Greek and the original context and the original language, there is not enough years in your life or in the life forever to understand what it means. The Hebrew word for hope, and one of them, is kava, and that's Q-A-V-A-H. Kav is the meaning for a cord or a rope, and that as you pull on it, it creates tension. The best way that I can think about it is like a tug of war, is you've got two teams and you've got, and they start pulling on that rope, and what actually then happens is that rope is either going to, the little flag in the middle, the rope's either going to snap or there's going to be a sudden jolt and one team wins. Any which way, there's a suddenness to when it's finished. The anticipation and the stretching of the cord is the hope. It's like a waiting and an expectation that something is going to change. See, biblical hope is not based on circumstances. Not based on our circumstances. One must choose hope even when our circumstances don't allow it. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is a confidence. I love the way that services just tie into one another. We said, we sang this morning about building our life upon this rock. It is our firm foundation. Our salvation is our assurance. Our, our salvation in Jesus is our eternal hope. See, Believing in Jesus that he died and rose again and believing that he is coming soon is where our hope lies. Hope is based on something solid. It's something concrete. It's not a wish. That solid assurance is Christ and that he is coming again. That is something that we have to look forward to. That is something that we can base our hope on, even in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. With hope, there's expectancy. We are looking for Jesus. We are looking for him to come, even though our circumstance around us may not present itself in that particular way. If there's an anticipation around Christ's return, then our lens and our viewpoint about how we do life shifts. With an eternal perspective, we are busy. And when I say busy, it's not just about Keeping busy in life, doing life, sucking oxygen, making money, 
They are all good things. But being busy, again, in our biblical context is going and making disciples. Going out and being active in what God's called us to do. Verse 11 says, Therefore comfort one another and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Hope is the confidence assurance that Jesus is coming. And with this hope, we comfort one another. To bring comfort to one another means that in the uneasiness of our circumstances, in the uneasiness of what the future may look like, we have a role to comfort one another. Now, when I looked at the word comfort, it's very different to what we might feel. We think comfort, comfortable. Or comfort is we're putting our arm around someone and she'll be right. I'm here. Clarissa feels that comfort all the time. <laughs> but comfort ha does mean that, in a way, to come alongside, to encourage, to build up, and that's what we're called to do. But it also means to tell the truth. Give a little bit of a in the pants to nudge along. See, comfort is not allowing a person to fall into a place of comfortability. Comfort is to encourage them to move forward into what God's called them to do. As we come alongside someone, when we tell them the truth, and we again, we continue to point them towards Christ and his will, that's where we can step out and know that our hands are being busy. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples. Into, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Discipleship is one of the great ways in which we can comfort one another and encourage one another. Discipleship is one of those words that we say a lot, but do very little. We say the word discipleship lots and lots and lots, but we don't do it very well. I've, said, I've had conversations with people and they say, I don't know how to make disciples. And that's understandable. But if you can have a conversation, you can be a disciple maker. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have a doctorate in theology. <laughs> if you can have a conversation with someone, you can be a disciple maker. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I don't know if anyone knows of him, but he was a... a a pastor, a spy, and a writer in World War II. And he wrote this book called The Cost of Discipleship. And one very, very famous quote that comes from that book says, discipleship is not just something, it is everything. Being a disciple is not just something, it's everything. Discipleship requires 100% all in. Discipleship requires us to step out of our comfort zone, be uncomfortable so that we can hear what God is saying to us. Being a disciple is something that we are all called to do. It's not a choice. It's a command. It's not an encouragement. It's a command. When we are called to be disciples, we are called to be busy. See, being a disciple and being a disciple maker causes us to look out, like Mike said before, to look out, look up, but be busy. We can do two things at once. I know it's harder for men, but we can do two things at the same time. We can look out, but we still can be busy. Can I have the worship team come up? That would be amazing. This morning, my encouragement to you today is... What is our attitude towards Jesus coming? Is it excitement and anticipation? Or is there a little bit of benevolence around it? Is there a little bit of, oh, it's not really in my wheelhouse. My encouragement to us today is keep your eyes up, but keep your hands busy. 
this morning, if, you, if you're finding that that is something that you've been struggling with, sometimes we have busied our lives a little bit too much with the things of this world and haven't focused enough on what God's set us out to do. I've been guilty of that many, many times. You get bogged down in the day-to-days and you forget what you just don't have time for. But Jesus' call to us is, are you all in? Is this something that's additional to your life or is it intentional? My challenge to us is that our thinking is to shift to being disciple makers, not just disciples. I pray today that as we go out from today, that these aren't my words that have been spoken. That we hear from God each and every day. That what I've maybe said today gets you to go that little bit deeper, gets you to do a little bit more self-reflection about what am I doing to look out, to keep my eyes up, to keep my hands busy. Maybe I've been doing one more than the other. Maybe I've been too busy and haven't been looking up. Maybe I've been too busy looking up and not busy enough with my hands. So this morning, I'm going to finish. We're going to pray. And then uh, the team are going to lead us in a song to finish. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that you are you are king. You are sovereign. That you rule over all that you are coming again soon and that is something that we are very, very excited about. It should be at the forefront of who we are. It should be at the forefront of our, our perspective and our lens in which we look through in life. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you give us a sense of anticipation and expectancy, that you are coming. But in the meantime, we go about our Father's business. We continue to do what you have called us to do. We continue to pursue you in everything that we do. I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we move today in the direction that you have called us to go, that we do it with an intentionality around it, that it's just not shuffling one foot in front of the the other, just getting through life, but there is purpose. We are deliberate in our pursuit of you, Lord Jesus. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. We glorify your name and we exalt you in the heavenlies. All the praise and glory goes to you in Jesus' name. Amen.